clock back there says it's five, but we're going to go with mine. How about that? Would y'all stand with me? Father, I just want to thank you for the privilege of coming to worship you, for the honor of being welcomed into your presence through the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning and that you are the Alpha and the Omega, that before there was, you were, and after there is no more, you still are, that you are forever the same. You are a God of love, of mercy, of kindness, of compassion. You're a God of strength. You are a mighty warrior. You are the victorious one. You are more than a conqueror. You are everything that we need and so much more. And Father, I thank you for the gathering of the saints to worship and adore you, to celebrate your goodness, to declare your eternal goodness to us. Father, I thank you that you have saved us and you are saving us and you always will save us. I thank you, you are our healer, our deliverer. You are our king, you are the everlasting God. And we begin this gathering tonight with a shout of victory that you are our great and awesome God. Father, let this house be filled with your praises tonight. Let your kingdom purposes come forth. And I declare and decree that there is no weapon formed in hell or on the earth that shall withstand your goodness. We say that every tongue that rises up against us, we condemn it now in the name of Jesus and that every weapon formed against us they are defeated now in the name of Jesus and we declare that this is an open portal for your glory for your purposes and that the sons of Zadok are arising in this hour who have their faces set like flint to serve you to adore you to worship you and to minister first to you and then to do your bidding in everything else that we do so, Father, have your way among us. Have your bidding. Do what you will do so that your name is advanced and your kingdom established on earth, even as it is in heaven. Lift up a shout to the Lord our God. Oh, open the eyes of our heart, Lord. Oh, open the eyes of our heart. We want to see you. Oh, we want to see you. All right, now, some of y'all that haven't been in this place before, when we gather, it's not about I. So you'll find out that a lot of songs that you were used to singing, I, it's about us and we. In a corporate setting, so it's going to change just a little bit now. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Open the eyes of our hearts. We want to see you. Come on. We want to see you. Yeah. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Open the eyes of our hearts. We want to see you. We want to see you. To see you. I lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Oh, pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy, holy. I lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, holy. Open the eyes of our hearts, oh, open, open the eyes of our hearts, we want to see you, yes we do, we want to see you, yeah, oh, open the eyes of our hearts, oh, open the eyes of our hearts, we want to see you, yeah, we want to see you. your power and love we sing holy 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 to see you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory pour out your 
power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. We're singing holy, holy, holy. You are holy. Of 
all of creation bow before the ancient of day come on blessing and honor blessing and honor glory and power be unto the ancient of day from every nation all of creation bow before the ancient of day every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you will be exalted O god and your kingdom shall not pass away O ancient of days your kingdom shall reign over all the earth sing unto the ancient of days for none can compare to your matchless word sing unto the ancient of days For none can compare to your matchless word, singing to the ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Oh, blessing. Glory and power oh, be unto you, Lord. Into the of From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of day. For every tongue in, in heaven, heaven and earth shall say your glory, every knee shall bow at Come your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Oh, your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. None can compare to your matchless word. Sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your master's word, sing to the ancient of days. Oh, sing to the ancient of days. Oh, sing unto the Lord. Oh, we sing unto our God. Holy, mighty God. Oh, holy, holy King of Kings. Holy, holy King of Kings. Oh, you are Lord, oh Lord, rule and reign on high. understand what it is that we're doing right now we are erecting an altar to the ancient of days because see there are gods little g gods that have been erecting altars all over the nation 
And it is time for the church of the living God to raise up an altar that is ascended above every altar, every other altar. And when we build an altar to the ancient of days, what happens is it crushes every other altar under it. And so I want you to press in with exalting the ancient of days and call upon the Lord in the wondrous matchless name of who he is so i wanted you to see what we're doing we're not just singing songs we are erecting an altar and when that altar is erected what you begin to do is be able to see what the lord is doing and move with him because jesus said he only did what he saw the father doing and it is now time for us to move into a place at the altar of worship so that the Lord opens our eyes. We can begin to see what he's doing and move with him. And then we will see the power of God unloosed in the earth. Oh, you are everlasting to everlasting. You are everlasting to everlasting. Oh, you are everlasting to everlasting. Oh, yes, you You're the here and now God. Even though you are the ancient of day, you are the here and now God. You, I am that I am. You are. Oh, I am that I am. You are. Yes, you are. I
Can you see the smoke from the mountain? Can you see the smoke from God's mountain? The fire from his throne, holy fire from his throne. Oh, all consuming fire of Yahweh. All consuming fire of Yahweh. All consuming fire of Yahweh. Burn, burn, oh Lord. Set us on fire. Set us on fire. Holy, holy, holy desire. Sacrifices for you. We want to be living sacrifices for you. Not our will, but your will be done. Not our will, but yours be done. Not our will, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. Not Beckoning you to come to his mountain. We come, we come up to your mountain, Lord. We come, we come up to your mountain. Oh, we come, we come up to I saw the Lord open up the trading floors in heaven. I just saw this door open. 
And I knew what I was looking at was the trading floor of heaven. And we're at the end of what's known as dire straits, where Israel faced many difficult times historically, time and time again. And when they came to the ninth of Av, it was a time of celebration because they pressed through. And that's where we are right now. And I felt like what the Lord was saying to us is that as we continue to worship and we give tonight, we are making a trade on the trading floors to let go of what has been so that we can reach forward and lay hold of what he has for the future. Because there are those among us and out in the community that are in a very narrow place and not knowing how they're going to make it into this next season because things aren't looking the way they looked the sources are looking different than what they looked they're drying up in some cases they're being cut off in some cases and there's a shifting that God's saying, if you will let go of what was and lay hold of what I have for you, I'll pull you through the narrow strait. I kept hearing him say, reach out to me, I'll pull you through. But you can't hold on to what has been and reach forward and lay hold of him. Because if you're still holding on back here, you're not going to be able to reach into the future. Because there is a great future that he has for us it doesn't look like where we've been and a lot of times we misinterpret what's happening because we're looking for it to look like a good season in the past we do that when we're thinking about revival for most of us in this room we have been encountered with the Lord somewhere along the way that radically marked us and when we start thinking about revival we want revival to look like that and the Lord says, it's not going to look like that again. Because I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. But I do things differently so that you don't systemize what I do. Because we have a tendency to systemize the way God's going to move. And he says, I'm not going to allow you to do that. Because if you do that and I allow you to do it, you're making me into a God in your image. Rather me fashioning you in my image so you in order to move forward you've got to let go of what has been and when you reach forward what God does in those moments when you let go is he opens up dreams he opens up vision he opens up ideas creativity all those things that you need for the new when you let go of the old that's when it begins to open as long as you're looking back as long as you're holding back here you can't see it so Lord as we prepare to trade on the trading floor here with you tonight I release over your people an ability to let go to let go of what has been to let go of even the good things of the past season so that we can lay hold of the better that you have for us and Lord, for some of us, it's just going to be a symbolic act of something we do to let go. And that we come to this time of giving unto you our tithes, our offerings, and our first fruits. That we come and we say, Lord, receive our offering to you tonight as a symbol and a dedication of our heart that we're not looking back. We're looking forward and we're saying, God, pull us through, pull us through, pull us through so that we can come into that which you have for us. We thank you, Father, that the best days of the church are not in our history. They're not in our past. They're in our future. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. So as you're ready to give, just stand back up, begin to worship, bring your offering to the front, and make your trade with the living God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, you are here, working in this place. We worship you, God, we worship you, oh, you are here, you are here. We worship you, God. 
We worship you. You are here.
Just close your eyes for a minute. But if you are in the need of God coming through for you as a miracle worker, as a way maker, as a miracle worker, I want you to just put your hand up in the air. Wow. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we have declared and we have decreed who you are. That you are our way maker, our miracle worker. You are the one who goes before us. You are the one who makes a way where there seems to be no way. And Father, I declare that you are way maker, miracle worker for each and every one here. Lord, we are by faith lifting up our hands that we need you as a breaker in front of us. You are the breaker who moves out in front of us when there seems to be no way. We declare and decree that you are the breaker. You're going before those in need of physical healing. You are going forth in front of those who need relational healing. You are going forth between the, before those that need a job and need financial provision. Father, we declare that you are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You are the promise keeper. And I declare all your promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Let everybody lift up a shout to the Lord our God. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to begin thanking him for your miracle. Before you see it, thank him for it. Name it. Be very specific. Because you know what he's put on your heart. You know what the need is. And he is a good father. And see, if, if natural fathers will give us what we need and what we ask for, how much more our Heavenly Father? If you need bread, ask Him for bread. If you need a job, ask Him for a job that's more than enough. If you need healing, ask and receive the healing you need. And see, healing can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be relational. It can be in your soul, in your spirit. It can be in your body. We've got testimonies in this room of people with healed bodies. People that shouldn't be standing here today are standing in strength, in health, in wholeness. I'm going to just build faith as you're being seated. If you have had a miracle in your body, in your lifetime, I want to build faith. I want you looking around. Who would not be here if God had not touched you? I want you to see this. Miracles. We would not be alive if it weren't for the Lord our God. We praise His name. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift up an offering of praise. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I just love God. He is so good to us. Right during five minutes ago, it just opened up. I mean, it is so opened. The heavens just shifted. It shifted. It shifted for everybody in this room into a brand new place. I mean, yeah. miracles are yeah. being released, says the Lord. Things that you have not even thought that you needed, God said he is bringing them to you. He is a miracle worker. He is a way maker. I'm telling you, he's making a way where you think it's a dead end. And God says, there's no dead ends in my kingdom. And when we were worshiping into the mountain, I saw the Lord bring us. We walked right into the mountain. We walked into Zion. That's where the miracle is. There is an open heaven, says the Lord. Begin to soak in it. Begin to ask him for things. Your families are coming in, says God. Those neighbors that are the hard ones on your block, says the Lord. And God says, I'm creating a job where there is no job for someone. I am making, I am making promotions begin to happen. The Lord says, even this week, there'll be promotions coming into you. 
you, says God. And the Lord God says, I'm giving you a clearer vision that you've never had before. God says, I'm coming in the night season and I'm standing at the foot of your bed, says God. And I am giving you revelation and answers that you have been longing to know, says the Lord. God says, I am opening up the book of the scrolls that are, you have your names on them. And God says, I am promoting the scroll that City Gate has today. There is a new anointing and a fresh wave coming, says the Lord. This will be known as a house of miracles. The way maker, God says, I have seen your, 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 your giving. I have seen your tears. And the ancient of days is beginning to walk and take resident here. God says, he loves you with a new love that you've not had before nor experienced. So begin to experience waves of love coming over you and through you. And God says, you will become the miracle workers. You're our way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You're our way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. of all kings that is who you are you alone are a miracle working God You're brighter than a thousand suns that's who you are just one drop of your blood can set a whole host of demons fleeing. Just one drop of your blood can save the lost. Just one drop of your blood can set the captives free. Just one drop of your blood can heal every disease. So, Father, now in the name of Jesus, we pray for family members and loved ones that do not know you. And it is just one drop of the blood that can save anybody. But I'm reminded of the thief on the cross 
who simply said, remember me this day. Lord, we pray for those that even in their last moments that they would encounter you. And they would know you beyond a shadow of a doubt. And Lord, we pray for those that have known you but have wandered away, the prodigals who went their own way. We call them back into the Father's house. We call them back into an authentic relationship with you. Lord, that you, the Spirit of the Sovereign God, would touch their wounded hearts. And Father, we cry out for those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. God, that there would be such a breaking in of the miracle working power of God that Holy Spirit would visit young and old alike and cause them to see that you're not simply a God that we say, we know you saved us, but that you are Lord and you are Lord of all. And that you are a God who desires to transform us and to change us from glory to glory as we behold you in intimate relationship. Father, I am asking and I'm calling in those who have never heard of you, who have never known you, who've never had an opportunity. Lord, even in this community, that there would be an unlocking of opportunities for the gospel to go in and to bring the fullness of who you are as our Lord and our Savior. And Lord, that you would anoint us as your people to be vessels of your love, carriers of your mercy, and speakers of your truth that would cause hardened hearts to turn. And those who have even been rebellious toward you to bow their knee and to come to you. Father, we bind up every spirit of condemnation, every suicidal spirit, every spirit of death, of violence, of anger that is permeating throughout our culture. We say in the name of Jesus, cease and desist. And that the anointing of the living God that came to set captives free, we loose it out into our families, into our community, and into this nation in Jesus' name. We believe you, God, for salvation, not just for eternity, for salvation that enters us into the abundant life here and now. And Lord, in this moment, we pray for Kathy Vogan and her, her mom and for Richard and the rest of the family as her mom is nearing the transition of life. Lord, we pray comfort and peace, your shalom to fill their home. Lord, that you would strengthen them in their innermost being and that her transition to glory would be one of peace and tranquility in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray for Rick Heath and Teresa as his father is nearing the same stage of his life. And Lord, we pray that you would hover over his, his room and over his bed, that you would minister life unto life unto him, that you would minister truth unto him, that you would minister love, and that you would surround him with your glory. Father, comfort Rick and Teresa and Janet and David and Beth and Jim and the rest of the family, Father, that you would give them a strength in their innermost being to walk through these days, knowing that you are a God who sees and you know, and you are the God who supports and you comfort in and all through, through all things. And Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone but you walk with us each and every day because you are a God who will never leave us nor ever forsake us. And your mercies, they are new every morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jackie, if I can come over and give you guys a word. Um, this is directed at you, sir. The Lord said, I brought you here 
and I have directed you to come to this place because you're going to hear what you need to hear. And the things that you've been struggling with, even in the past, and even things that you're thinking the future isn't going to go my way, the Lord says, I'm giving you keys to the kingdom to give you a specific knowledge of where he is taking you and what he wants you to do. I don't know if you are in ministry. What do you do for, can I ask you that? Okay. Well, the Lord said he's going to open up areas for you that have been rough and have been hard. And he's going to take some situations that have been difficult and he's going to turn them around and it will work in your favor in the days ahead, says the Lord. I am moving obstacles out of the way so I can position you from here to there because God has a there place for you and he's going to be moving you along this route rather quickly and it'll be like you're going at warp speed but he wants he's making up time for where blocks and obstacles have been in your way and he is the miracle worker he's going to move you swiftly from here to the there that has your name on it Wow. Um, Joan, can you come and join me? Um, I asked Joan, I kind of put her on the spot, but Joan is leading our children's ministry. And uh, we were going to do a meeting afterwards tonight, but we're not going to do that. So I want you to hear a little bit from Joan and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, yes, we are um, in the process of. Um, having our children's ministry reopen again. Um, we have really felt impressed by the Lord to go ahead and take that step forward for our children. As you know, they are returning to school many this month, um, but they also need a place in the house of the Lord. And, and we have children who come here. I don't know where the flock girls are hiding over there, but, um, <laughs> but um, they are a very significant part of this body and this vision, and they bring friends. And more families are going to be called to come here, and we need a place for them. So I want to encourage you. I know um, even before I became a teacher, public school teacher, I remember somebody once got behind the pulpit, and this is a very seasoned minister, and they said, you know, once upon a time I worked in children's ministry. And he says, you'll never forget that experience, and God will bless you in a very special and unique way when you serve children. And so... I'm going to read you this quote by Henry Adams. It says, a teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. And so that's what God places on your life when you serve children. You don't know where that influence stops. I don't care if you're a music teacher, a coach. I don't care how you serve children. God will always bless you with favor. So I'm encouraging you, if God has been kind of dealing with your heart about serving, whether you want to be a teacher or an assistant, I guarantee you that he will deposit something in you, but also that he's going to mature our kids because we ha we're raising kingdom kids. We're not just raising children with the knowledge of the Bible. These are warriors right alongside of us, and they need people like us to walk alongside and to make sure they come into the fulfillment of their calling purpose. Excellent. Wow. So here's my admonition. If that stirred you, see Joanne after the service. Just go get, make sure she has your contact information. As she was talking, I can remember um, some kids that I served when they were five years old. And now they're serving the Lord and their kids are serving the Lord. They're teachers, they're ministers business people and that was a long time ago because they're all like 40s mid 40s now and they were five so it really is true when you touch children you don't know where that influence goes there was one of the kids that um, both Mike and I served 
when they were in elementary school who now needs a lead, has led in the past, not right now, but in the past, led an international missions organization, had missionaries thousands around the world. So you never know what your sound and your love and your touching a child can do for them. So I know many of us, you know, we've got grandkids, we don't have kids. I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you, take a rotation. We're not asking people to be in there every week. We rotate, male, female, both. You have to go through a background check. Uh, Joan has materials and training, and you don't go in there unprepared. But we need people because I'm with Joan. I know that there are families coming in. And one of the reasons they haven't come in is because we have not been as fully equipped for children as we need to be. And that's because we've got to step up to serve. So this is me calling you, step up. If you're in there during a Sunday and you don't get to hear the message, it's posted by Tuesday. <laughs> and I'll be sure you get it. <laughs> so, you know, and, they, and we love for our kids, we really want our kids in during worship because I think part of the problem we've had in, gener in the past generation is that kids were not in worship in the place of encountering God with everybody. They were isolated and separated. And I, from, the day, from day one, have said, no, we need to have the kids in the atmosphere. Even if they're sitting down coloring, they're still in the atmosphere. Right. Having the freedom to move around and, and learn their movement in worship, yeah. it's not about all sitting prim and proper. It's about encountering God. <laughs> so I want to encourage you with that. And then, Chris, can we put up the announcement for next week? I think he's got it. Yep. Yeah. Next week, we're going to meet at our regular time at 5 o'clock. But starting at 5.55, this is a word that's gone out across the nation. In fact, it got published on Elijah List this week uh, that Clay Nash had. It was a dream he had uh, about a month or so ago. And we're going to do 55 minutes of worship and proclamations over our nation and specifically over our president. The essence of the president, over the essence of the dream was that he had this dream and there was somebody coming out of a closet and blowing, you know, the cans of like silly string that kids play with? They were coming up from behind President Trump and blowing silly string over him to cause his brain and his thought process just to be fuzzy and unable to focus. And the word in the dream was, the word of the Lord in the dream was, surround him with worship. And so we, we feel like that's an assignment from the Lord that we come and we worship the Lord God Almighty and release decrees into the Oval Office, into the White House, so that he can think clearly and make the decisions and speak clearly the way he needs to in order to move this nation forward. I told the group on Tuesday night that the verse I pray over him every single day is that a, there would be an angel watch over his mouth and a guard over his lips that he might not sin against the Lord. And I believe we need the power of agreement over that one. Because I believe there are times that what comes out of his mouth is right, said in a wrong way. And the people that I know that are close in, he, they call him a, he's a new believer. He's not seasoned. Have good resources that saying he has bowed his knee to the Lord, but he needs to mature. How many of us need to mature? How many of us in our first few years of being a believer stuck our foot in our mouth? And if we were not raised in the, I mean, and that's for those of us who were raised in the church that were told how we're supposed to talk. What about those we know that didn't have a clue? And sometimes even if they did, sometimes we have to have this conversation. You ain't saying that here. <laughs> so just join us in praying and, and plan on being here next Sunday night. We'll worship. I will probably kind of reverse the way the service goes, and I'll do a little bit of a setting up and a little bit of teaching closer to the beginning 
and then we will go into worship and intercession, very similar to what we do when we do our Friday nights of uh, worship and intercession. So plan on being here for that. Um, just a reminder, next weekend, uh, the Screaming Eagles Summit will be in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm assuming Dr. Don is going to live stream that. I do not know that yet, but I'll, if it is, I'll just share it onto the KTM Facebook page. Uh, there's a number of us going. We will be back in time for Sunday night, so we'll be here. And then the end of August, if you are planning on going to Model Tennessee and to Red River the last weekend of August, please let me know. Uh, we're going to go and we're going to follow. Uh, again, it's another dream um, of a prophetic word to go into Model Tennessee and go to the Old Forge. And God's releasing a word there. And then we're to go to Red River and seal it. So I'll, if you're interested in going, I can give you details. You will need to make your own hotel reservations for the Friday night. And then some will be coming back on Saturday and some will wait and come back on Sunday morning. That's totally up to you. But there will be service here on Sunday at 5. So <laughs> just know that. I felt like it was important that we get to Red River. And I had been praying into it. And then Randy came to me and said, I really feel like we need to get on to the site of either Red River or Cane Ridge, one of the sites of the Second Great Awakening. As part of what we're, we're sensing and believing is that God is releasing a Third Great Awakening in this nation. And we're beginning to see signs of it. In the midst of great turmoil, the glory comes. Have you seen some of the reports out of, is it Sean, how do you say his last name? Foyt in California? And the thousands on the beaches coming to Christ and getting baptized. I mean, that's phenomenal. In a state that is shut down, the glory is hitting. See, that's what God does. In the midst of gross darkness, glory shines. And people get transformed. It's what happened in the Jesus movement. They were in the middle of protest and burning buildings and everything else. And God showed up. Walked through the midst. And when you go back to the first, second great awakening, it was in what was leading into the Civil War. And there was great conflict all across the nation. And beginning in the early 1800s, which is what happened at Red River, there were pockets of revival and outpourings of the Holy Spirit that were happening. By the time they got to Cane Ridge, it was thousands out all over a field. And it was so impactful. People would tell their their family, when I die, bury me, bury me at Cane Ridge. And I'll tell you, when you go to these places, you step in to that atmosphere. When I went to Cane Ridge, I mean, you just step in. You, it's pregnant with the Spirit of God. Red River the same way. And I've had the privilege of going to sites in Wales, in Scotland, in Ireland, of revival where the Spirit of God poured out. These chairs up here, if you wonder what they are that are offering Chester on, they're from the Welsh Revival from 1906. You see, God, God's releasing. And he's building our faith. So if any time you want to come sit in these chairs, you can. Or kneel at it and pray, you can. You're not praying to the chair, but you can just <laughs> tap in. <laughs> You can tap into that anointing and say, God, you're not a respecter of time or persons. What you did then, do it now. That's my prayer. And do it with purity. I mean, come on, God, we're hungry. So um, this last week, I just began sensing the Lord talk to me once again about the sons of Zadok. And I think Chris is back there and is going to switch over to Keynote so that we can do this message. And I actually have notes for y'all today. It's amazing. Um, but I've done this message a number of times in different ways over the last 20 to almost 25 years. Uh, first time I ever delivered a version of this message that was in Norway. And I had gone on a trip there and the and release this message, and I had people looking at me going, where did you get that? I've never heard it. But I had been praying it for 10 years. And the way I was praying it was, God, I want to be like the sons of Zadok and not like the sons 
not lot like the priest who go astray when the world is going astray. So we're going to look at the sons of Zadok, righteous ministers unto the Lord and unto his people. And there was a prophetic word that came out in the last week to 10 days by Lana Vosser. And one of the lines out of it was, I care about how people carry what they carry. And she was speaking about the stewardship of gifting, anointing, platforms, and mantles in this hour. Because we know that the word of God says that the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. So have you ever wondered how somebody who is highly anointed and falls and still ha carries their gifting and their anointing? You kind of go, what? It's because God said it in order that the giftings and callings are irrevocable. It does not mean he honors them, though. People who have fallen in gross sin can still, because of the gifting, lay hands on people and them get healed. Now, if I were God, I wouldn't do it that way. But God, in his wisdom, did it that way. And I'm glad he's God and I'm not. I mean, thank you, Jesus. But I do believe he is dropping a plumb line in this hour to say, I want my people to be holy and righteous and true. I don't want them to carry their anointing and carry their gifting and, and use their platform for selfish gain, for vain imaginations, and for their own exaltation. It's not about us. One of the lines, parts of the prophetic word that she gave is, is the Lord said to her, and he repeated this several times, my glory is coming. How many of you have heard that? My glory is coming. God keeps saying it. He keeps taking us back to Psalm 24. But then she went on to say, the Lord said to her, my glory will not reside where there is impurity. I've got an echo in the sound. If we can do something, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, those that will house my glory are those that will have stu that ha that have steward. Stop. Read again. Those that will house my glory are those that have stewarded what they carry in purity, because they minister to me and are friends with me. Their hearts before me are pure, and there's no mixture in them. They are like the sons of Zadok. This is the hour where there will be mighty demonstrations of my glory that will be carried by those who are living in purity and ministering to me is their greatest priority. There is no selfish gain within them, but they burn with love and adoration for me and have no desire for selfish gain or self-exaltation. Lord, let us be as the sons of Zadok. So we're going to first look at the wayward priest who go astray. Ezekiel 44, verses 10 through 14. And the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. In essence, iniquity is I will do what I will. I will do whatever I will do. It's self-will. So they will bear their own iniquity. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary as gatekeepers of the house and ministers of the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them. Because they ministered to them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity, Therefore, I have raised my hand in an oath against them, says the Lord God, that they shall bear their iniquity and they shall not come near to me to minister to me as priest, nor come near any of my holy things, nor into the most holy place, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. Nevertheless... I will make them keep charge of the temple for all its work and for all that has to be done in it. That last verse is one of the saddest verses in all of scripture to me. 
that God says, you can't come near me anymore. But just keep doing, take care of the house. To me, that is just like, God, anything but that. So what is the wayward priest? The priests that the Lord rebukes are those who stray far away from the Lord. They stray away from his word, from his ways, from his will. They stray away and they go into what the culture says is okay. See, I'm saying it that way because we need to understand that when we begin to make church look like culture, we're straying away. When we begin to accept what the culture says is acceptable, but God's word says is not acceptable, we're going astray like the priest who went astray in Ezekiel. When we're saying, well, grace will cover it. You just keep on doing what you want to do. I'm telling you, folks, the false grace message is an abomination in the kingdom. Because what it's doing is it's excusing people's sin and saying, you keep on sinning, it's okay, God's going to forgive you. He may forgive you, but for the priest who were saying that, you're in trouble. And actually, if you keep saying it and people believe it, that they don't have to turn from their wicked ways when they believe Jesus and they can keep on sinning, they're probably not even saved and will face a surprise when they die. That's not a popular message. I get it. But it is truth. Because there's a, there are list after list after list in the New Testament of those who will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And when you're embracing all kinds of evil and saying, oh, it's okay. After you've said yes to the Lord, it's not okay. And that's not about being legalistic. It is about living by the word of God. The Lord rebukes those who tolerate and embrace idolatry which is a compromise to God's call of holiness. We have to take a look at our lives and, and ask the question, Lord, do I have idolatry in my life? What do I put between me and you? What do I prioritize over the Lord? That's an idol. We've had a uh, number of discussions around here over the recent weeks of how in our nation right now there is an idolization of culture. Now, they may be calling it cancel culture, but it's because they're idolizing their culture. I want you to hear that. The cancel culture movement is because they're idolizing their culture. You can't have a, div it can't be devoid. You're either going to have a culture of light or a culture of darkness. All of our other cultures, white, Asian, black, Hispanic, whatever, they have to come and submit under the culture of heaven. And so when you start saying, my culture is over every other culture, that is idolatry. It's just idolatry. The Lord rebukes those who lead others astray. When the church leads other, others astray, God's going to reject us. I'm going to let that one settle in a minute. We cannot lead other people astray into doctrines that don't line up with the word of God. God is serious about who he is and who, what his kingdom is. And he's gone, look at the world. You see how crazy the world is right now? Look how compromised the church has become over the last 30 to 40 years. Refusing to call sin, sin. Refusing to promote honor. Refusing to promote holiness and the fear of the Lord. Where did the fear of the Lord go? And God's saying, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm done. I'm going to call forth a people who are pure and holy and undefiled. So what are some of the counterfeit characteristics Counterfeit or false worship, counterfeit anointing, 
and counterfeit authority. Let's break those down real quick. On counterfeit worship, counterfeit worship is that which is self-centered and man-focused. Now, there are songs that God will give us in the context of worship that will be encouragement to you. That's not counterfeit. But the counterfeit worship is when it's all about me. It's all about us. It's not exalting that we have a great and awesome God who lives eternally, who is forever and ever the God of all things. In him, through him, and for him, all things exist. When it becomes about making our life just comfortable, it's not real. It's got to be worship that emanates out of heaven, not worship that emanates out of earth. Counterfeit worship fuels the passions of the flesh. It'll make you feel good. Counterfeit worship, I don't have this on the list, but it will never lead you to repentance. True worship and the holiness of God moves into a room, you'll start repenting. Counterfeit worship produces false spiritual encounters and experiences. You can get all kinds of goosebumps in counterfeit worship. See, for me, the difference between true worship and counterfeit worship is does it produce a transformed life? See, when you worship and you're exalting him, there's something on the inside that, sh that shifts and changes. Because you've encountered the true and living God. What about counterfeit anointing? It produces results of fanfare and sensationalism. How many of you have had somebody come and pray for you and they're highly anointed and they hit you so hard you fall over? I hate that stuff. Just saying. Or come, you know, screaming and yelling. And I know we've got passion. I mean, I, I sometimes say, God, can I just be quiet and calm? And, and he goes, it's not the way I made you, daughter. <laughs> and when I get into passionate intercession, I get fiery. I wish, I, I honestly beg God to let me do it in a nice, soft, quiet, demure voice. <laughs> Isn't happening. But there's a counterfeit to try to stir it up and prove to the onlookers that it's power. That's a counterfeit anointing. A counterfeit anointing will never bear legitimate fruit that endures. True anointing will produce fruit that lasts. It'll be the transformation of lives. It'll be the changing of the way we think and the way we react to people, the way we respond. A counterfeit anointing operates in pride or false humility. And I said it this way for a reason, because pride we often think of as boisterous and out front and pushing and look at me, all that stuff. But false humility, oh, I'm just nothing, you know, is still drawing attention. It's still pride. It just has a different face on it. And a counterfeit anointing will use the situation that will bring them the benefit. So usually could act either way, depending on the audience you're in front of. I'm just shooting straight. I've observed a lot over the years. What about counterfeit authority? Counterfeit authority releases an atmosphere of control and domination. Have you ever walked into a scenario and you feel like you have to tiptoe on eggshells because the authority in the room might smack you? <laughs> or make you feel like you're condemned? What about the counterfeit authority that demands honor but never gives honor? And actually will resist giving it to other people. Counterfeit authority produces strife, contention, suspicion, and division. 
And one of the things I want to say about counterfeit anoint, a counterfeit authority is it's not always who's up front that's the counterfeit authority in the room. It's a lot of times what you've heard, you know, you've got the one that's here, but somebody's turning the neck. There's the counterfeit authority. We need to un- learn how by the Spirit of God to discern and distinguish between the counterfeit. And look at this next graphic. I think it's going to, you're going to have to hit it a few times. I thought I had it so it would not have to fill in bit by bit, but it does. So you have Baal, who is Satan, and he is the counterfeit to God the Father. Oh, no. Oh, you went one too far. Oops. If oh, So did I, by the way. <laughs> This is not good. Anyway, <laughs> you've got Baal up in the, in the top, at the top of the pyramid. And I have it that way because Baal will always seek to rule over everything. The actual name actually means husbandman. And so it's a false husband. Don't worry about it. I'll get it up there another time. I actually have mine. I'll show you. Can you see that? Um, and so it's a false authority. It's controlled domination and even win- wisdom that is sensual because it's drawing to self. Then you have the queen of heaven, which can often be seen as Jezebel, and it's divination. Easy definition of divination is a, it can even be a, prof- a right prophetic word with a wrong motivation. Divination has, is connected to false worship. It's directing in a wrong way. It's used to seduce and to manipulate people. And then you have Leviathan. Now, we had Don Lynch come in the first of the year. I'm not even going to begin to touch on the wholeness of Leviathan like he did. But it's pride and sorcery. It's false revelation. It's twisting. It's a false anointing. It can sound really, really good. It can be convincing. Our news media right now is operating under a false anointing. It is anointing that is birthed out of hell. See, we've got to learn how to recognize it. But see, if the world is operating in that, guys, we're supposed to be the ones through whom Holy Spirit is restraining evil in the world. Unfortunately, the church has been guilty of falling under this operation of false worship, false revelation, and false authority. We want to be free. Anybody else want to be free? All the way free. But God said he's going to be raising up sons of Zadok. So let's look at who are the sons of Zadok. Back to Ezekiel 44, verses 15 through 31. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept my charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. And it shall be whenever they enter the gates of the inner court that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house. They shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers on their bodies. They shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. When they go out to the outer court, to the outer court to the people... They shall take off their garments in which they have ministered, leave them in the holy chambers, and put on other garments in which their holy garments shall not sanctify the people. They shall neither shave their heads nor let their hair grow long, but they shall keep their hair well trimmed. 
No priest shall drink wine when he enters the inner court. They shall not take as wife a widow or a divorced woman, but take virgins of the descendants of the house of Israel or widows of priests. And they shall teach my people. Hear that again. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. In controversy, they shall stand as judges and judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my statutes and all my appointed meetings, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. They shall not defile themselves by coming near a dead person only for father or mother, for son or daughter, for brother or married sister, unmarried sister. May they defile themselves. After he is cleansed, they shall count seven days for him. And on that day that he goes to the sanctuary, to the minister in the sanctuary, he must offer his sin offering in the inner court, says the Lord. It shall be in regard to their inheritance that I am their inheritance. You shall give them no possession in Israel, for I am their possession. They shall eat the grain offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. Every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. The best of all first fruits of any kind and every sacrifice of any kind from all your sacrifices shall be the priest. Also, you shall give to the priest the first of your ground mill to cause a blessing to rest on your house. The priest shall not eat anything, bird or beast, that died naturally or was torn by wild beast. Isn't that amazing? Aren't we glad we don't have to follow all the legalities that are in that passage? Sometimes we just need to hear it all so we can remember how much we've received through Jesus. He paid the price for all the legalities in there. And there are some symbolisms, and that's why I went through and read it all. And then I want you to take a look with me quickly at New Testament priest, the priest unto the Lord. Revelation 1, verse 5b and 6. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Say, I have been made a king and a priest unto my God. And then 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. We are coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Say, I am a part of the holy priesthood. Isn't that good news? So we have been made priest by faith in Christ through his precious blood. We are adopted and we are made heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest. We are empowered by the power of the Spirit of God to live as priest, holy, faithful, true, and undefiled. You could make that declaration over your life every single day and come into a greater understanding of who you are. But that's who we are. That's who we've been made. So the priest of the Lord is, that the Lord esteems is faithful and true. Fully devoted in love and obedience to the Lord. In other words, when things start squeezing you and life gets tough. Anybody else have moments when life gets tough? The kids are screaming. The boss is fussing. The dishwasher overflows. The washing machine decides not to work, and traffic snarls up, and you can't get where you need to get. Life gets tough. But when life gets tough, we remain faithful and true. We remain in that place of, God, I trust you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to look to you. I'm going to lean into you. I'm not going to try to make it on my own. I'm going to listen for heaven, and I'm going to be faithful to whatever you say. That's being faithful and true. 
The praise the Lord esteems is one that lives fully unto the Lord. Pursuing holiness in the fear of the Lord. See, holiness is not something that we pursue because we're afraid of failing. It's because in the fear of the Lord, we love him and we want to serve him. We want to live for him. We want our lives to be such a delight to him that we pursue holiness. We don't want something out of us to bring him displeasure. One of the greatest breakthroughs for my own life was when I realized I didn't have to do what he said because he said it but because I loved him and wanted to. It was okay to do it because he said it. It's kind of like when I, my kids were little, I say, you don't have to know why, just do it. I said so. But it was better when they came to a place where they loved me enough and understood that obeying me was a demonstration of that love. It's the same with, way with us, with the Lord. I don't have to do what he says do. I want to. I want to because it delights my father's heart because of his love and my love for him. But the Lord esteems those that are holy and undefiled before God and before man. And the Lord kept saying this phrase, as the church goes, so goes the world. See, we've often heard people say, as the world goes, so goes the church. No, 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 that's reversed. The way we go is to set the spiritual atmosphere But see, we also need to be so living above reproach that when the world looks at us, they see the holiness of God. When ministers fall in sexual sin or embezzlement or all the different things that we've read about over the years, it causes a dishonor and a blight to come upon the name of Christ in the world. And God is saying, I honor and I highly esteem those who are called by my name who give no reason for the enemy to have accusation against my people or against me. So our desire is to live in a way that's holy and undefiled before the Lord. So when they look at us and they look at our lives, they're like, wow, they serve the Lord. And we just smacked them really hard. And we just screamed at them and they didn't scream back. That doesn't mean you roll over and take it. But we have to learn how to respond, not just react. We have to bring our flesh into submission to the spirit. Because then you have the sound out of heaven that can respond and make a difference. There are some of the regulations and restrictions that God gives to the priests of Zadok. We have to minister by the spirit and not by the flesh. That's what that whole deal about don't wear wool is about. Because wool represents that which would cause you to sweat if you get out there working in the flesh. I mean, ministry is hard work. In case you didn't think so and you think that those of us who are in ministry sit around and twiddle our thumbs all day and just get up here and do this for an hour... It's not. It's hard work. There's a lot of times when you're, you're processing through things, you're praying through stuff, you're meeting with people, you're counseling, and it's like, I walked in the other night and Mike said, you're beat. And I went, mm-hmm. <laughs> I was done. But it can't be by the flesh. It has to be by the spirit. It can't be just by what I have figured out in my own head, in my own understanding. We have to minister by the spirit of the Lord. And this whole thing about do not touch or go near any dead thing, it's called avoiding defilement. Don't put yourself in a place that you're getting defiled by things that are of death. It's not just about a dead person. It's about something that's carrying the stench of the death of the flesh, the death of of the enemy. We don't need to get ourselves in a place that's an atmosphere of death. That's why I can't, and you know, if you can and the Spirit of God doesn't tell you, no, I'm not going to because it's not my job to be your Holy Spirit. There's certain movies other people can watch. I can't because it puts me in a place where I I can't handle it. And the Lord said, no, don't, don't touch that. But see, we have to give each other the liberty and pray, Holy Spirit, guide us. 
but don't touch anything that produces death. See, when we shift from thinking what is right and wrong to what produces life and what produces death, it will liberate you. See, there are certain things that I, if I watch it, it produces death in me. I can feel the, the life of the spirit in me waning. It may not bother you at all. That's why it's not right and wrong. It's life and death. I can watch something else that brings me life and I get all kinds of revelation and you're going, you watch that? But the Spirit of God's talking to me and I'm going, I'm seeing all kinds of pictures and all kinds of analogies. I mean, I'm watching cartoons with my grandkids right now and I'm watching Lion Guard and I know it's got all kinds of stuff in it, but it's got the tree of life and I'm getting revelation about getting to the tree of life to be healed. <laughs> so it's... God said, watch it. So then I'm able to have the conversation about getting to the tree of life that's planted in the garden of life that God gives us interest to through Jesus. Take advantage of every opportunity, right? Somebody else, it might be death to them. I'm getting life out of it. <laughs> and we are to keep the laws and the statutes and the Sabbaths, and that's not to be legalistic. But it's to adhere to the expression of the loves of the Lord. I remember when my messianic friend David Schiff said to me probably 20 years ago, the Ten Commandments are not commandments. They are expressions of his love. They're his ten loves. Because God knows that if we will follow those ten loves, that it will go well with us. It's not about a commandment that's rigid. It's about, I love you so much that if you will follow in these ways, your life will go well. Can you imagine what would happen in the nation and in the world if we would just simply follow those ten loves? But then there's the privileges and responsibilities of the priest of Zadok. you got to love this first one. You get to draw near in the holy place. You get to enter into the presence of the Lord and minister to him. You get to go in and shut everything else out. It's not like the priest who go astray and you go do the stuff. You kill the bulls. You kill the doves. You clean up the bloody mess. Come on. But you can't come inside. To the priest of Zadok, he says, come inside, draw near, come close, come sit with me a while. Just come be with me. He's inviting us to be a people who will just come be with him. And once you've been in with him and you've sat and you've listened and you've learned his ways, then he says, now then go out and you can minister to my people. See, the ministering to the people has to always follow the ministering to the Lord because then when you minister to the people, it is out of the overflow of your intimacy with the Lord. And out of Colossians, it says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it as unto the Lord. So even when we're ministering to people, whether it's at the grocery store checkout line or on your job or somebody calls you on the phone and you're praying with it's ministry. But you're doing it as unto the Lord. You're not doing it for them to see what a great minister you are. You really don't care. It's not about that. It's about ministering to him and letting his life flow through you. But teach the people to know the difference between what is clean and unclean and to discern according to his word. See, we're going to have to learn how in a new way to discern what's going on in the world. Because what's going on in the world, there's a lot coming at us constantly. And if you don't know the word of God and you don't know the ways of the Lord, and you don't know the ways of the kingdom and the way the Lord works, you can get really caught up in a lot of swirl. So part of my goal this year has been with us to help us grow in discerning what is of the kingdom and what isn't of the kingdom. 
And how do we process through the constant menagerie of information that's coming at us? How do we process through the, this conflict and that conflict? How do we discern what's coming from conflicting stories within the medical community? I mean, who can keep up? God, what are you saying? What are you saying? How can we keep up with what's going on in the nation politically? I mean, is anybody able to figure that mess out? God, what are you saying? Because we've got to get to a place that we can look at the word of God and discern it. And if somebody's standing for abortion and death, we go, that's not of the kingdom of God. I know how to discern that. It gets pretty simple. And then we have to show people how to discern or perceive what is holy and what is unholy. What is holy is that which is not common. Now, see... Y'all, some of y'all are young enough, you don't remember the days of the real strict holiness. I couldn't have my hair cut short. It would have to be long and in a little bun in the back, and I'd have to wear a dress. You know, I didn't wear pants to school till I was late elementary or middle school, and I didn't wear jeans till high school. I'm not that old. <laughs> but you, you see what the difference is? But it was about a holiness standard. That wasn't about holiness at all. It was about legalism. But see, holiness is being uncommon. We, to be holy is not to be like everybody else out here. God is altogether different than everything we see out in the world. But it has a purity about it. it it's undefiled with the ways of the world and the ways of the enemy. And it's, it's beautiful. Holiness is a beautiful thing. The Lord told me years ago that often people think about holiness and sanctification like wearing, uh, you think of John the Baptist in a camel coat, right? That doesn't sound very pretty, does it? He said, that's a wrong look. He goes, that's not the way I see it. And I had this incredible vision. And it was holiness and humility was as a diamond studded mantle. And he said, it's, I want you to see it that way because it's not about you. And the brilliance of the diamonds on that mantle reflect my glory, not yours. And see, we often think about the holiness and the humility piece of, you know, downtrodden and you know, sad and somber. The world wants to see the glory and the joy. They want to see the beauty of the Lord. It's the beauty of holiness. So we're, we're learning how to discern the difference. The next one, the next slide, is we have the privilege and the responsibility of judging in righteousness. See, the priests of Zadok obtain increasing measures of the wisdom of the Lord, of the counsel of the Lord, of knowing what the, how the Lord would discern and how he would judge in certain situations. And so he releases to the priests of Zadok the ability to judge in righteousness with wisdom and in justice in issues of righteous judgments to resolve and reconcile in matters of conflict and controversy. Do we need some priests of Zadok in the world today? Do we need people in every sector of society who have spent time in the presence of the Lord that have the wisdom of God to know how to navigate through some pretty awful conflicts and controversies? We need some people in political office that have the wisdom of God with the priest of Zadok anointing to know how to maneuver through the mess that we've gotten ourselves in. We also receive the Lord as our inheritance. Isn't that great? He is our inheritance. And the bountiful provision comes from him. When we begin to see that the Lord is our provider, he is our inheritance, there's a freedom that comes. 
And I, I want to use Chuck Pierce and Glory of Zion as an example on this because I've known Chuck long enough for almost, tw- well, about a little over 20 years now. And I have watched him so trust the Lord for his provision that he's given it all away. I can't even tell you how many times. Not just ministry, but personal. And God has always brought it back and multiplied it. When I first started going out, they were in a place kind of like this. It wasn't much bigger than this. And now they're in, what, 150,000 square feet. And this last month, they've taken a lot of their decorations, a lot of their furnishings, a lot of their stuff, and they've given it away to widows, orphans, housed a bunch of homeless people, given them housing and furnishings. They've helped start a food pantry or fuel into a few. They didn't start it. They're just supporting it. They've taken of what they had and given it away in order to make way for the new. It's an amazing testimony of how they, Chuck, and then the ministry at large, they've learned how to so trust in the provision of the Lord that at times, because I of knowing some of the things I have known, that they didn't have enough to pay all of their bills for the next week. God would speak to them, give something away, and the money would come in the next week, and it'd be right on time. Because of the development of the life of faith and trust that they've developed and understanding the principles of first fruits and sowing and knowing how to discern and hear the voice of the Lord. They don't do that because, oh, if I give it away, God's going to give it to me. That's foolish. You don't play with God that way. But when you hear and God says something, you can so trust him, you can move out on it. And he will do an incredible thing. I just watch it in amazement. And many of you have heard the story that when we were trying to get in this building, God said, give a significant gift. And I do mean for us it was significant. And mail it to a ministry in Florida. Because we were at a stalemate, we couldn't get in a building. It wasn't anything wrong with our finances. It wasn't anything wrong. We just had buildings would flow, fall through our fingers. And God said, send this check to the ministry in Florida. We wrote it. By the time they got it, we had a contract. And I know it was God. He was our source. He was our provider. He said, do this. And he brought it through. So what are some of the abiding and genuine characteristics of the priest of Zadok? You can guess this one after I gave the counterfeits before. It's going to be true worship, true anointing, and true authority. So true worship, true worship is focused upon the Lord and what he desires. See, for too long we've had worship. We've gone, well, what song do people like? I had somebody say that to me one time when I was a worship team. I said, it doesn't matter. (laughs) It's not about what the people like. It's about what is God requiring. Because if you go with what people like, if I was to take a poll in this room right now, I would end up with it probably at least 20 different opinions of the style that you would like. Well, (laughs) I hope we hit your button sometimes. (laughs) But that's not... That's not the goal. That's not the motivation. If we give the Lord what he desires, he loves you so much, he's going to bring something that touches your heart. And that's where we can trust him. True worship creates the atmosphere in the room to reflect what is in heaven. See, there's worship going on around the throne room all the time. And it's exuberant. It's full of life. It's releasing the word of the Lord. I believe heaven is declaring loudly, wake up, church. I think that's one of the sounds around the throne because they know the heart of the Father. 
And so out of that atmosphere of holy, 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 they look, would y'all wake up? Would y'all see how holy he is? One of the Hebraic understandings of them saying holy, holy, holy is that every time they say holy, they're seeing a different expression of who God is. And for all eternity, we'll be saying holy. For all eternity, we'll see something different about our God. Something magnificent about our God. Something we don't even begin to have words for today. True worship fires the passion of first love in our hearts. Because when you get into a place of worship, it's like when we got into way maker, miracle worker, all of a sudden, that sound of heaven was birthed into this room and you could it was tangible. It ignited us to want to serve him more, to get closer in, to move with him, to be as he is, to be what he wants us to be. It unlocks revelation. That's why Claire had this word for our new brother back here. Because we're in this atmosphere and God says, I want to encourage him. That's what God does in the midst of worship. Because that was releasing a genuine encounter and experience of the love of God. I know I was experiencing the love of God. The power of his presence just coming in upon us. What about a true anointing? True anointing operates in humility and confidence of spirit, in purity, passion, and power. Humility is not being mamby-pamby. True humility enables you to step out in total confidence of who God created you to be. Because humility is not thinking less of yourself than you should. It's thinking of yourself what God thinks of you. Who does God say you are? Just agree with him. See, whoever God made you to be is who you are. You don't have to make that bigger or less. Just be. Just be who he says you are. Don't try to over project and don't try to pull yourself back. Just be. God will make a way for you. You don't have to make a way for yourself. A true anointing always leads, exalts God and leads other people to Jesus. It's always pointing to Jesus. A true anointing is not about drawing people to self. It's about pointing people to Jesus. A true anointing brings liberty. The word of God said is the anointing oil that breaks the yoke of bondage. A true anointing, all of a sudden you'll go, wait a minute, I just got free from something. And nobody had to do anything other than just get into the anointing. Because God does amazing things. A true anointing releases the supernatural grace of Christ. When you come into a true anointing, you can do more with less. You can accomplish what you couldn't accomplish before. Um, a number of years ago, I was commissioned to write a 40-day prayer guide, and they, I'd had about 40 days to write it in, which seems kind of like write a day, write one a day, right? I couldn't write. I was stuck. And I'm down to a week before my deadline. And I'm like, God, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and he gave me a vision and outlined it. And I wrote 40 days in 40 hours. I stepped into an anointing. And I was panicking. <laughs> but I knew that if he didn't come through and he didn't do it, it wouldn't happen. And I was prepared to go to him and say, it didn't happen. But there was that key that unlocked the anointing. And it was done. That's available the supernatural grace of God is available. The true anointing bears the fruit of transformed lives. Your own life. Because the anointing that teaches you, that guides you, that leads you, right? Because the anointing of God comes into your room and says, we need to work on this. I want to show you this. I want to teach you this. And it transforms us. But then he uses you under the anointed hand of God and you speak a word 
and a life begins to transform. And you may not even know it for a long time because it doesn't matter. Just be that anointed vessel. And then true authority. True authority is rooted in authentic relationship with the Lord and in accordance to his delegated authority. See, God gives us authority based on Jesus has all authority. He says, all authority has been given unto me. Now I give unto you. So we have authority that comes through Jesus. But then we have delegated authority that is based on the assignments that he has given us. I can't walk into Joanne's classroom and have authority unless she gives it to me. And I have it to the measure that she gives. But she doesn't have the same authority here. She has a powerful authority in her arena. And I wouldn't want it. I'm glad you have it. <laughs> but that's her delegated authority. See, we all have a place where we have delegated authority that is rooted in our authority that comes through Jesus. When you're operating in true authority, the authority of heaven will back you up. In other words, when you begin to decree in the authority of heaven and in the authority of the name of Jesus, say in our intercessory times and in our de declarations and decrees, when you hit that place and you're in alignment with heaven with what you decree, you'll begin to see things shift. There have been some of the prayer gatherings nationally that we've been a part of that we've been able to see things shift like almost immediately. See, certain people shift and move. And I believe God is calling us as the sons of Zadok, as the ecclesia. He wants us to hear more clearly so we can declare more succinctly. And he says, I want to release heaven. I'll release the angels of heaven. I'll release the armies. I'll release what is needed to accomplish what you decree that is what I'm decreeing out of heaven. A true authority releases an atmosphere of liberty and security. People are able to step in to be who they are. To the things they've dreamed of, the things God said, there is an authority. True authority will release confidence to step into greater expressions of the gifting and calling that's upon your life. True authority extends honor lavishly and receives it graciously. Clay Nash does this probably as good as anybody I've ever met. He gives honor lavishly. He honors other people. And yet he has an ability to receive it very graciously. Because it's often easy to give and not as easy to receive. But he does it beautifully. It's a good example. And I'm using these different ones as an example so you can see where some of this true authority operates. And the last point on this is it cultivates an atmosphere of love, trust, and strength. It, true authority gives you the freedom to fail so that you can have the liberty to succeed. Because if you don't have the freedom to fail, you really never have the liberty to succeed. I remember years ago there was, um, Chris, you can try to get the next slide up while I'm talking since it's another one of those that <laughs> may take a minute. That someone stepped out and it was their first time to lead worship. And uh, we were in a different scenario. We were not in the normal sanctuary because they were renovating and all this stuff was going on. And they really didn't do a very good job. But do you know what? It was their first time to lead on their own. It happens. It happens to some that have led for a lot of times. I mean, you know, it's not easy. But do you know that person never got to lead worship there again? And the Lord said to me, that's where I got this phrase, you will never have the liberty to succeed if you don't have the freedom to fail. So I'm grateful I'm not grateful for what he had to go through, but I'm grateful for that nugget of wisdom because we have to be able to step out and stumble because we've all done it and we all will do it. But it is in that journey 
that we gain strength, we learn, and then we can come into a place of having the liberty to succeed. This is the contrast of what we looked at a while ago with Baal. We have Father God, who is the true authority. He is the sovereign Lord over everything. We have Jesus Christ, the living word, out of him and for him, to him, through him, is true worship. And then we have Holy Spirit, the grace and power of the true anointing. Which do you want to be under? I know where I want to be. So quickly, I'm going to go through these last few points um, of how these fit within an apostolic ministry. We've been in this series on alignment, and I felt like this needed to be in here so we can see how all this fits together for us. In worship, that ministry to the Lord is our first priority. Everything is as unto the Lord. It also is reflective in reasonable acts of service. Because in Romans 12, when it talks about offering to the Lord your reasonable worship, it is reasonable acts of service. So if you're on your job, it's an expression of worship. As you do it unto the Lord, it is worship unto the Lord. And then it is the living a sacrificial lifestyle, dying to self daily. That's not a popular message in the modern American church. But that's where we have to live. If we're going to live in true worship, we're going to have to be willing to die daily. That's what Jesus said. So if it's what he said. I think it's kind of important. What about anointing? Anointing comes forth in prophetic ministry. I would add intercession, laying on of hands, impartation of gifts and callings, of the anointing to heal, of signs, wonders, miracle, of sozo, salvation. See, that word sozo is not just salvation as in from eternal hell. It is sozo. It is salvation, body, soul, and spirit. It's deliverance. It's healing. It's the whole package. We need a restoration of sozo in the body of Christ. And it leads us into being in one accord. What you see in Acts 2 is apostles gathered in the upper room. You see, apostles and disciples gathered in the upper room. It wasn't until later on in the chapters of Acts that you began to see the prophets, the pastors, the evangelists, and the teachers coming forth. It was all birthed out of the apostolic. And so that's where the anointing comes. It's where it flows. It, it then flows and multiplies through everybody. It's not for one or two. It's for the all. And then authority the authority in the apostolic house, you will see it manifested as building as a wise master builder, putting things in order, setting boundaries and foundations and structures for things to operate and to operate properly and with strength. You will see equipping and fathering, coming and bringing people into a place of maturity in all of their areas. And as Don Lynch so, so adequately says, fathering is not gender in the house of the Lord. I am really glad. The authority will be affirming of ministry. And it will be affirming of your ministry, whether it's inside the four walls or if it's on your job. Because ministry is not to be inside four walls. See, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are to equip you for the works of ministry where you live, work, and play. Everywhere you go. You are to be empowered and equipped to do the ministry because you're going to see people that the rest of us never see. You're going to have opportunities to minister to people that none of, us, none of the rest of us would ever have that opportunity. But you need to be equipped, well-positioned, trained, and ready to minister in the moment. Apostolic House of the Authority sends and commissions people into their assignments like we did last week with the teachers going back into school. That was a sending and a commissioning for this new school year. And then the teaching of foundational apostolic doctrines. You see, God is looking for a holy priesthood, priest of the sons of Zadok, commissioned to worship as priest, ministering to the Lord, operating in the anointing, 
to teach the difference between the holy and the profane where you live. And walking in authority to govern even in matters of controversy and dispute. We all have a choice. We'll be as the priest of Zadok living true and faithful to the Lord in righteousness, justice, and truth to lead others to the Lord. Or will we live as those who went astray, living compromised, people-pleasing lives that lead others far from the Lord? He's looking for a holy priesthood. Who's ready to join the ranks of the priest of the sons of Zadok? I believe God's wanting a company that multiplies. That goes out and so touches the world around us with the love and the truth and the life of God. That the ranks of the priest of Zadok multiply. Because see, what you birth people into the kingdom as is what they grow as. Now, some of us have had to come out of some other stuff. But I believe in this third great awakening, we're going to be birthing a bunch of priests of Zadok. Priests of the Lord that are as the sons of Zadok, righteous, pure, true, and undefiled, that are welcomed as their first priority to minister to him. That the first and the greatest delight of our heart is to sit with him in his presence and with his word and listen to Holy Spirit. I encourage you in this season, get you a journal. If you don't have one, get you one. And begin to journal what is Holy Spirit saying to you. What scripture is he highlighting? And then sit and listen. It doesn't have to take real long. But it's a part of training us to be the priests, the sons of Zadok. It's a part of that learning to tune our ear to hear what he's saying. And then you get those instructions. Your ear has been tuned and you order your steps to move as he says to move. And he transforms us from the inside out. So mighty men and women of God, let's stand. We will not meet Tuesday night. Just so you know, this is our first Tuesday night of the month. We won't be here, so we will be back the next Tuesday. So, Father, thank you so much. I thank you for the richness of your word. And, Lord, I pray over each and every one of us that we would spend time cultivating the heart of a son of Zadok. That we would sit with you and listen to you. We would allow you to sanctify us holy body, soul, and spirit. That we would hear the revelation that you're bringing. That you would tune us in discerning by the spirit of God, by the word of God, according to the kingdom of God. And Lord, I, I ask that in all things... We would be a people that are welcome to minister in the Holy of Holies. And that it would never be said of us that we can do the work but not draw near. Lord, draw us closer. Closer to you. Because out of being closer to you, we then become closer to each other as we all grow closer to you. So, Father, I bless these, your people, and thank you, Lord, for the honor and the privilege of serving you by serving them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Love you all, and we will see you next week. Pray for us as we go to Florida, too. <laughs>